All right, this will be Mr. H's last video presentation of semester number one. We're going to have two of these reviews, again, that parallel your multiple choice part of your final exam. But as you can see, there are no multiple choices here. So this should make it even easier when you've got choices to check against. There will not be a video for number two, because again, with it running parallel, we can use this one. There will be a key available online and in class, but that'll be the only part of that one that you see tomorrow. Okay, let's get down to this. Simplify the following expression. I notice there's a minus in the middle here. So first thing I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to do some distributing here. And then here with this minus, I'm going to take that negative 4 and distribute that through, making sure I'm being careful with my signs. Once I've done that, I'm going to go looking for like terms. Again, pay attention to your signs. Don't just do 7 plus 20 or write 27 and have a problem. Get that written in there. Negative 42 plus 12. And if in doubt, use your calculator. It's 30 and I'm set. Okay, so hopefully that's an easier one. Now, when you get to the fractions, we've talked about this before. There's a couple of ways you can find a value that's going to help you. We're going to get rid of all these fractions. Now, to be perfectly honest, for those of you that kind of can just look at things, you're going to see the least common denominator for this would be 20. But for those of you that struggle, what we've talked about before is you take each of the different values that you see down in the denominator, you multiply them together. 5 times 4 is 20 times 2 is 40, and that will still get you to where you need to be. So then, whether I use the calculator or my brain, I'm going to use my brain, Okay, 40 times 1 half, maybe I know that's 20. But if I didn't, what I'm doing is I'm going to be taking this number, I'm going to times it times the number on top, so 40 times 1 is 40, and then divide by this number. So 40 divided by 2 is where that's coming from. And I'm going to distribute that all the way through. 40 times 2 is 80, divided by 4 is 20. Oh, you wish it were time to go already. 40 times 3 is 120, divided by 4 is 30. And then finally, 40 times 4 is 160, divided by 5 is 32. And now it looks like a normal problem. So once I get here, I want to get all my x's together. Doesn't matter which side it's on. For some of you, you're going to be driven nuts by my clicking. Just going to be changing some colors here as I go to try and make this a little bit better for us. Okay. I want to get my 10x by itself. So I would add the 32. Let's come over here. And don't flip out if you get a fractional answer. Okay. Now when you get the multiple choices, they will be in fractions. So I mean, if you're like, can I work this through and do it in a decimal? You could. But that's not going to help you. Now, maybe you get to the end and you're like, Hardy, I get to 52 over 10 and there is no answer. Maybe, I mean, you don't know that now. You don't have multiple choice. There's no answer that does that. Okay, this is when you make sure is your fraction in its simplest form. And if it's not, well, part of your problem is going to be it needs to be. Okay, that would be the answer that you'd see if this were the final exam. Okay, and I'm going to try and give some hints through the way here too to help you avoid some troubles. Number three, I'll tell you where the problem is going to be. Okay, Whenever you see pluses or minuses, please put parentheses in right away. Because otherwise what people tend to do is when they go to cross multiply, if there's no parentheses, they just multiply the 6 times the x. They forget about the 5. And when they multiply the 3 times the x plus 3, they multiply by the x, but not the 3. The parentheses should be there to remind me that I've got to distribute to both terms. And now it's a problem real similar to what we just got done with in number 2. I want to get all my x's to one side. And again, if they're on opposite sides, i got to do opposites. Once they're all together, new job, get them all, get them alone. Opposite of minusing 30 would be 2 plus 30 to both sides. And then divide by 3. 
So again, it's just your basic Algebra 1 skills being put to the test. Okay, solve for t. What am I doing to t? Multiplying it by 8. What's the opposite? Divide it. You're like, wait, that's not it. Yeah, t is by itself, isn't it? Okay. Sometimes they're going to be pretty straightforward like that. Take advantage. Rental car company. Charges a daily rental fee at $29 plus 53% per mile driven. Write an equation that describes the relation between miles and cost. Okay. I'm going to pay the $29 no matter what so it doesn't get a variable because it's not going to change. 53% for each mile, though, does. So that's where the M has to go. And those two things together make my cost. Make sure that you're paying attention to both variables. But again, if you had multiple choice, hopefully you'd see that. But be careful. We just might be sneaky enough to just switch those two around. You have to pay attention to your variables. Just saying. Okay. When solving the following system, what would you multiply the top equation by to eliminate the x's? Okay, let's think about this for a second. If I want these x's to eliminate when I add down, what do I want this to become? What's the opposite of positive 6? Negative 6, okay? So I want negative 6x. So if that's 3 and I want it to be negative 6, what do I have to multiply it by to get there? Negative 2. That's all I need. Don't solve it. Just what do I multiply by? Fill in the blank. Go about your business. All right. Senior class at high school A rented and filled nine vans. Blah, blah, blah. Let's follow to work what we want. System of equations. You need to set this up. On the final, the systems will be there. You just have to pick the right one. But here, so I'd have nine vans and 14 buses. Gets me 576 students. High school B, four vans, 11 buses, 390. That's it. Don't solve it. Just set it up. Okay. Go about your business. Rolling. I'm hoping you're feeling good about this already. You should be, I would hope. Okay, solve. Absolute value equation. Two equations. First one, write it down, just copy, leave it alone. Don't change anything. Second one, we're going to change the sign of our second answer. And then we're going to solve both of them. So this is not a plus minus one. We're actually going to solve these separately. Because what you're going to see here at the end when I divide by 2 here, I'm not going to get negative 16 for my other answer. Guaranteed that's going to be one of the choices. Here when I add the 6, if I owe somebody $26 and I pay them 6 back, I better owe them less now or there's some shady business going on. Divide by 2. Okay, get my answer. Do your due diligence. You have time to do that. 80 minutes is a lot of time. Solve and show your answer in interval notation. Similar to what we just did in number 8, we still are going to need two inequalities. Copy the first. When you get to the second one, two things are going to change. The arrow and the sign of my solution. And you might want a piece of scratch paper as you're doing some of these, because you can see we didn't give you a ton of room to work with. Get my 4x alone. I'm going to add my 2 and divide by 4. Same thing on the other side. I'm going to add my 2 and divide by Four. Now, I'm not done yet. Okay, The answers are all going to be in interval notation. So what I would suggest is the same thing that's suggested here. I would make a quick sketch of a graph. And I'd be like, okay, x is less than or equal to 5. Less than goes left. And x is greater than or equal to negative 4. That goes right, and they crash in the middle. What does the interval notation of that look like? It's left to right. 
Now, if they'd have been going out from each other, that's the one that gets the infinities. And we may see one of those a little further along. But that's something I've got to keep in mind. That's why the graph helps and I don't just guess. Okay, write 12 to the 2 fifths in radical form. Remember, when you're looking at your exponent, it's exponent over root. So there's my radical and my base of 12. There's my exponent. There's my root. Now, I won't guarantee it. That may be the way it looks, or it may end up multiplying this out, and then we want to look at that number. But I think that's the way this is going to work out. Exponent rules. Okay, When we're multiplying, we add the exponents. Now, this is one of those that you can either choose to find the common denominator yourself, or if you're like, why am I going to do that? I have a calculator. Good point. So I take 3 fourths plus, not times, 2 sevenths. We're not doing no decimals, no. X to the 29, 28. So all you've got to remember is that it's add. Just like on number 12, You've just got to remember that it's subtract. But you need to make sure your answer ends up with the bigger exponent is. You're like, I don't know which one of those is bigger. How am I supposed to know that? Well, one way to find out. 3 divided by 8, 2 divided by 5. Which one is the larger value? Well, 0.4 is. So my answer is going to end up in the denominator, which means I'm going to have to have a 1 over the top to show that we're in the denominator. But otherwise... We've got, we always go bigger minus smaller. No decimals. I'm just looking at this for a minute. Yes. And we're set there. Okay. But that's how we work those. Bigger minus smaller, put the answer where the bigger exponent is. If the 3 eighths would have been bigger, we'd have just kept it up there. Simplify the radical. Remember, there's this little root 2 out here. That could come in handy in a minute. Square root of 36 is 6. And remember, for exponent rules, it's exponent over root. So I'm just going to write it out here. Six divided by two is three. 14 divided by 2 is 7, and I'm good. So as we're working through these, the big thing to remember is just going to be, take your time, let the answers guide you sometimes a little bit. Sometimes you can do a multiple choice question, and I even do a lot of the math work, and just by process of elimination find the answer. So give yourself that opportunity. All right, is the following relation a function? When I look at this, are the x... Values different is really the question. X values, are they all different? Nope. If they're all different, the X values, then it's yes. What's the domain of the given relation? Domain is my X values. I'm just going to list them. Okay, It's not interval notation. Don't put 2 to 10 in parentheses or brackets. Individual values. And if you are asked for range, that would be the y values. Okay? Could be either one. I'm not sure. What's the domain and range of the function? Okay? Now we've talked about this enough. Whenever there's a parabola, the domain, I don't have to think. It's going forever left and forever right. That's just the way it is. The range, though, I got to pay a little more attention. I see it's going up forever. But it doesn't go down forever. It only goes down to right here. Down to negative 3. And that's it there. And make sure you're careful because I'm sure, again, one of the questions is going to flip the domain and range to see if you're paying attention. So remember, domain, left, right, range, down, up. Evaluate. Okay, This doesn't mean plug the negative 5 into both. We're going to look at the inequalities. Which one is 5 true for? Is negative 5 less than 2? Yes. Okay. That means we're going to plug it into the top 
expression. If it wouldn't have been true, if this one would have been true, we'd have stuck it into the bottom. And I work that out and I get my answer. You're like, man, he's kind of pacing it here. Well, a lot of this stuff, again, people, is stuff that you've seen before and that you can do. It's just kind of getting you a little bit of a background on some things. All right, describe how the graph of the function f of x equals the negative absolute value of x is related to the graph f of x equals absolute value of x. Okay, here, if there were shifts, you'd say the direction. But what does the negative absolute value of x do? Well, negatives flip because x normally opens up, okay? You could say flip, you could say opens over x axis, okay? But if it's left or right, which it may be, you just say, you know, shifted two to the left or three to the right or whatever that happens to be. Because remember from the front page, Whatever's inside the absolute value is my left, right. Whatever's outside is my up, down. And I just have to keep track of that. And speaking of that, name the vertex of the following. Now be careful. A lot of you here would say negative 2, 8, which is close. But remember our form, it's x opposite of h. It's the opposite of that value inside than this k value, okay? Got to be aware of that. Factor completely, okay? First question every time is what? I'm assuming somebody at this point said they have something in common. Okay, they're both divisible by 9. They both have an x. And now I just look, what do I, what do I still need? Well, I already got the 9. I got 1x, but I need 2. I need one more. 9 times what gets me to 27, 3, and I already have an x. That one's good. And if it's a multiple choice test, you always could distribute it out and see if it equals the answer. Tell them I told you that. 21, factor. I see perfect squares. Okay, you're going to have your factoring flow chart. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that as we were going along here. You're going to have your factoring flow chart, which you'll have seen in class today, and then some of the equation forms, which is going to make things nicer for you. So that'll be good. So I square 3x to get 9x squared and 8 to get 64. And then you could just use the form that's on there. 3x plus 8. 3x minus 8. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, what else we got? Identify the domain and range. You're like, wait, how would I do that without seeing it? Well, we'll look at it in a minute, but let's do this first. What are my shifts on this one? What are my transformations? Well, I've got right two and up five. So that actually tells me where my domain and range are going. And let me explain why that is. Normally, if we have no shifts, if this were just y equals the square root of x, my domain and range would both be 0 to infinity. But I'm moving right to, which is positive, which I'd start at 2 and go to infinity. Okay, my range moved up 5, went from 5 to infinity. But you're like, what if I don't remember that? Am I, you know, if I don't remember that, am I just kind of hosed? No. What I could do... So I could pull it up on here, and if you look at your chart and pull it up, check this out. Error, error, error. What's the very first thing after the error? Those first two values is the start of my domain and the start of my range. Okay? So I can get them off the calculator if I need some help. Just kind of saying. Okay? It'll always be the first value right after error. Okay, which is the correct equation for the graph shown? Normally there'd be equations here, but we don't have them, so here's what we're going to do. We need to label our center, which is at 2, negative 1, and our radius, which is 2. Because what you'll notice on your help sheet is that the standard form of a circle is there, which is x opposite of h y opposite of k equals 
r squared. And again, look on the back of your help sheet and you'll see this form that I'm talking about with the circles. Okay, and so the only thing that would change for which is the correct answer is going to be that the radius squared actually would be completed. All right, what else we got here? What's the axis of symmetry for the following parabola in the given equation? Okay, first thing, where's my vertex going to be? Opposite of h. K, axis of symmetry is always an x equals equation. So once I know the vertex, I just take its x value. But again, take the time to do this first. One of the answers is going to be x equals 7. And I'm going to have too many people choose that because they're just not paying attention. So remember, it's the opposite. And again, use the help sheet on this. That All these things are there. There, they're there. See, vertex form opposite of h, okay? All these things are going to be there. And maybe when you get your sheet and you first sit down at the final, maybe you make yourself a note like, this is left and right, this is up and down, okay? Or that my vertex is hk, or that my center is hk, okay? Those are the type of things you can do once you get your sheet when we get to the final. All right, we shoot an arrow upward. This should look familiar. And the height of the arrow is given... 20 seconds later. How long until the arrow hits the ground? Okay, two ways I can tackle this, and I'll show you both. One way is to type it into my calculator. Okay, I'm going to get my window back to normal here. I noticed when I was doing the other one, it was a little out of whack here. Okay, so I'll get my graph up. And what I'm looking for is this value right here. So how do I do that? I do second trace. I want to look for a zero. That's another way of describing it. And I'm going to hold down the right arrow until I see it coming close here. You're like, oh my gosh, you've been going forever. Watch the Y value. It'll start coming down here in a minute. Here it comes. Starting to head back towards zero. There it is, okay. And once I'm semi-close to the x-axis, same thing we've done before. We're going to go left, because again, left bound tells me which arrow to use. One, two, three, enter. It's okay if it disappears. There's my little border. Okay, right, we're going to go right. One, two, three. Now we're back where we started. And one, two, three more. Enter. Trapped in. So that's one way to find out how long it's going to take to hit the ground. About 8.47 seconds. Here's the other way if you don't like messing with the calculator, especially if you don't have a cheat sheet telling you what to do. And this is on your cheat sheet. Wait, Hardy, did you just say something that's not correct? I did just say something that's not correct. I was thinking about the time that it took to reach its peak. So, nope, that's what we're going to be doing, okay? Use your trap, use your trap, use your trap. This is what I was, I was thinking a question ahead. Okay, that happens sometimes. I wish it wouldn't happen on video, but that's life. All right, Denny punts a football. Height can be mounted. What's the maximum height of the football? Okay, here's what we've done in here, and this is going to be your easiest route. Here comes the negative B over 2A part. All right, there's my B, opposite of B. Two times, there's my A. Multiply this out first. I've noticed some of you before, you try to type it in all at once and you don't get the right answer. Okay, 1.5. Is that the maximum height? No. Will that be one of the choices? You know it. Well, how do I get the answer then? Plug this back in. Okay, that is my answer. Okay, so use negative b over 2a and then find your y because the y is just the y value of your vertex. And that may be one you need to look at a time or two. Okay, solve by factoring. B 
Biggest thing here is to remember the solve part. Multiplies to a negative. Adds to a negative means the negative is going to be bigger. They're four apart. Seven and three. Don't stop. And luckily with multiple choice, you're not going to have a choice. But do remember that you're setting them equal to zero and you have to do opposites. Don't choose negative seven and three. That would be sad. And get those set. Solve by square rooting. What's the squared mean? Well, it means two things. One, we got to take a square to get the answer. And two, there's going to be two answers. Now, we're not gonna, you're not going to see decimals. Here's what you are going to see. You're going to see something where you're probably going to have to break down the radical. So you need to have a grip on your perfect squares at this point. Okay? They're on your sheet. So start looking the list over. Get the biggest one. Biggest one is 16. Okay, and the one that's perfect is the one that gets out of radical jail. Don't put two square root of four. That's that's mm -mm. And then the last thing people have had issues with, let's try to get this fixed. This isn't negative 6 plus 4. This isn't plus or minus 2 square root of 2. The negative 6 is over there, but it's not combining with it. You can't simplify that anymore. you got to leave it, got to leave it, got to leave it. Quadratic formula. Make sure it's equal 0. If it's not, make it that way before you do ABC. So we got the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac is negative 2 all over 2a. And we've spoken before about how you just want to get this part that's underneath. Don't put it under the radical because if it's not a perfect square, we want to know what that value is. So 73. Now, do I try on this to see if 73 breaks down? You're darn tootin' you do. You try a bunch of stuff, you find out nothing goes into it. Okay, at that point, you're done. So I, probably if you'd see that as an answer, you wouldn't worry about it anyway. You just think. Okay, speaking of breaking things down, here, negative square root of 144. Now, let's just type this in my calculator. Non -real. Oh, yeah. Why? Because when it's a negative under, I've got to pull an I out. Man, where's my eyeball when I need it? There, there's, there's my eyeball. Looks more like a wheel, but, you know, it is what it is. I'm a math teacher, not an artist. Square root of 144 is 12 I. Okay. Subtract, again, bolded for a reason. Do not foil or box this one out. There's a minus in the middle. We're just going to change signs here, and we're going to combine like terms. And we're good. Okay. Now, 32 is a different story. There is no plus or minus right in the middle. I do need to multiply this out. And most of you have found, okay, foiling is fine. But maybe, just maybe, you need to box it out. And again, you're multiplying what's on the edges. Reminder. I squared equals negative 1. So this is negative 35 times negative 1, which is positive 35. So when I go to combine my like terms, I can do that. And this isn't a factoring problem. Do not try to take a 2 out, okay? If there was a fraction we could, we might be able to reduce, but there isn't, so we don't. Just multiply it and be done. Solve, if there's a radical by itself, we square it. That cancels the radical, but be careful, okay? 
8 squared is not 16. That'll probably be one of the answer choices, though. And divide by 3. Again, at this point, if you've done any practice over the semester, a lot of this should be really snapping off quick for you. I, I, I certainly hope. Oh, down the home stretch we come. No, down the home stretch we come. That is the home stretch. Woohoo! Okay. So, if your main thing right here is just kind of copying this, okay, when you get the second one tomorrow, try doing that one completely on your own, okay? Or maybe grab an extra one of these and see if you can do it on your own and use this as, as a key or something like that. But don't just sit, look at this, spoon feet, and then be shocked if you can't do it on the final. Because if you haven't had the practice, you're not going to get there. And this, again, will be the only video. The keys for both will be posted, though. And this is a good time now with the period a little bit left over to ask any questions you may have moving ahead. Have a good one.